He'll draw near to you. He's here today. His spirit is here. His presence is here. He's here. The presence of God is here today. The presence of God is always moving, always active. Back in the beginning, it says the spirit of God moved on the waters. And he created all that exists. Today, he's here. In John, it says, he, Jesus said that it would be a well of living water springing up in us. If you have the Spirit of God, if you have the Holy Ghost, that well is active today. It's still flowing. It's moving. You don't have to be in a church building. You can be anywhere. You can be by yourself on the job, and you can activate and move in that flow. But I'm telling you, sure as I'm standing here today, that flow is active here today, the flow of the Holy Ghost. And we can move and, and breathe and, and tap into that flow of the Spirit of God today. Father, we want to move with your presence as your presence moves. Father, we join together in one accord to fill after the presence of God, to fill after the flow of your Spirit, oh God. I pray, God, your Spirit would flow through us as we fill after you. God, move in this place. I wonder if we could sing this course as a prayer, as a united anthem of our intention, of what we want God to do in this place today. It says, Overflow in this place Fill our hearts with your love Your love surrounds us You're the reason we came To encounter your
hearts to heaven right now. Father, you, as you envelop us with your presence, with your power and your glory, as we exalt your great name, how great is the God that we serve. And we lift you up today. Can we lift him up right now? Come on, he is great and greatly to be praised. He is the God that keeps covenant and extends mercy to all that follow him with all of their hearts. Come on, right now, with all of your heart, with all of your strength, can you lift him up right now? Father, we magnify you. How great is our God. Lift him up right now. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. We exalt you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. It's our God. Oh, we'll see how great. As we lift him up. As we exalt him. Everyone will see how great is our God.
gratitude. say that praise is comely or it's fitting for the upright in heart. If you've got an upright heart, you desire to be in the presence of the Lord, praise is fitting today. And the psalmist goes on to tell us how to praise. He says, praise him on the stringed instruments, on the drums, on the cymbals, on the high sounding cymbals. He goes down the line. He says, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. And he says, let everything that has breath Praise the Lord, hallelujah, because God is worthy. So grateful for the goodness of God and the opportunity to gather with God's people in the house of the Lord and just give him praise. Praise sets the stage for the word of the Lord to speak into our heart. At creation and all throughout the history of mankind, everything God does, he does by his word. When Jesus walked this earth, he spoke a word of healing, spoke a word of deliverance. At the word of God, things happened because his word is creative. And I want to tell you, his word hasn't stopped. It's going to continue to minister. It's ministered in my life. It's ministered in your life. It's going to minister in this place today. And we're just creating an atmosphere that he has that liberty because where the spirit of the Lord is, the Bible says there is liberty. Lord bless you. You can make your way back to your seats. I want to welcome you to the Pentecostals of Peoria. Welcome all of our guests. So grateful to have you today. Just pray that you feel the liberty of the Lord. The music's playing. You feel like patting your feet, clapping your hands. Uh, you just take your liberty in the Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite our ushers, if they would, to come today. Wait on us for our tithe and offering. God's been faithful. We want to be faithful to give back to Him. Every good and perfect gift, the scripture says, comes down from the Father of lights. And out of gratitude, God, we give back to you of our life in dollars and cents. I pray that you would bless this gift and the giver today, Lord, as we sow back into your kingdom. Bless each life, if every individual in this place today. Receive not just our, our life in dollars and cents, but God, receive our praise today. And let it come up before your throne room as a sweet incense and savor. Fill this room with your glorious presence and have your perfect way in Jesus' name.
Lift my voice to lift my hands. 
Aleluia, aleluia What is the name of the Son? Jesus That's the easy one He said I came in my Father's name So if the Son came in the name of the Father And His Son's name is Jesus That means the Father's name is Jesus And He said the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost Which I will send in my name Holy is the name of Jesus Holy is the name of Jesus There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Hallelujah. I told the church in Pekin today the name of Jesus that everything in heaven, in earth, and under the earth come, must come to the obedience. Whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. Mm. The power of the name of Jesus power of the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And if you have been born again, the water and spirit had that name called over you and waters of baptism, you bear the name of Jesus. He said, the works that I do, greater than these shall you do. How? Through the power of that name. Holy is the name. Hallelujah. For millennia, thousands of years, the angels have stood and cried, Holy, 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 holy. No, God, don't get tired of repetitive songs that proclaim his wonderful holiness. And we ought not get tired of singing them or professing his holiness. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Have a little bit of business we want to take care of before we bring Brother Shelton to the podium. I don't think it's going to hinder anything. I was going to do it last week, but Sister Tysinger was wrangling babies in the nursery. And uh, we love this couple. It's been a wonderful uh, watching the power of God at work in their life. Brother and Sister Tysinger, would you come down here to the front? asking uh, the elders they come and uh, you know what you care pastors rest you care pastors come along with and uh, bishop mother lashley would you come brother and sister lashley come on amen brother and sister ty singer have accepted the vision and the call of god to uh, become care pastors here at P.O.P. And uh, I'm telling you what, this church of Pekin has flat thrown a monkey wrench in our plans. Praise God. It has grown, it's growing ministries and the church is growing. Uh, see, we have a few from Pekin here with us today. We praise God for them. But um, did y'all notice? Yes, absolutely. Our brothers and sisters from the Pekin campus. Did y'all notice it was hard to find a place to park this morning? Oh, I'm not talking about here at Peoria. I'm talking about in Pekin. You think we got problems here? And then it's getting too many more people. You have to come early to get a good seat. Now, I'm not talking about just here. I'm talking about the church in Pekin. And uh, as the church grows, it takes more ministry. It takes a wider ministry base. And Brother and Sister Tysinger have just jumped in this thing and thrown caution to the wind give their lives to the kingdom he didn't know what that meant whenever he said pastor whatever you need I talked to him last was it January maybe I said I want you to consider being a care pastor I believe in this couple I believe in their heartbeat for God, for the betterment for the church. They're completely sold out. So I said, I, I want you to consider being a care pastor. It'll probably take, some play, take place sometime in the spring. Did y'all know, y'all know that spring has sprung? I 
approached him two weeks ago. I said, you remember you told me you'd be a care pastor? He said, yes, sir. I said, it starts next month. March is the first month of spring, right? <laughs> he gulped real big. He said, yes, sir. I don't think we took him too much by surprise. He's been helping out, and uh, we just love this couple. And uh, I know I just had you be seated, but would you stand with me, and we're going to pray for this couple. We're going to commission them into the work of the Lord. It's not an elevated position. Well, I guess it is in a sense, but it's a lot more work, a lot more responsibility. And I believe 100% this couple is capable. And uh, so would you just stretch your faith and your hands toward this couple? And uh, would you guys just lay hands on him and Sister Ty Singer? And we're going to pray, God, you know, you knew the future. God, when you brought this couple to the, into the kingdom, it was for such a time as this. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would anoint them with wisdom, grace. God, let your hand be upon them. Strengthen them. Give them direction, oh God, in all the way that you would send them, in all the ways that you would use them. Lord God, without you we can do nothing. And sometimes we sell ourselves short because we forget that you are with us. God, I know you're with this couple. I know your hand is upon them. Now I ask God as we commission them into your work. Oh God, we commit them to the kingdom. They've already committed themselves. Lord, we've just given them an avenue in which to yield their lives to your glory and to your purpose. Use them for your glory, I pray, Jesus. Oh God, anoint them. Let their prayers, O oh God, be heard in heaven and in hell. Lord God, as they stand in the gap and make up the hedge, and they begin to, to intercede for those that are in their group, I pray, God, that you would undergird their prayers. I pray, God, that you would put your hand upon them and let the spirit of intercession flow through them as they carry the burden and the cares of this group. Lay your hand upon them and strengthen them, O oh God, I pray. In Jesus' Jesus name to you be glory to you be honor and power in Jesus name we ask it amen amen praise God God bless you God bless you they're gonna be taking uh, well what is was brother Staten's group in the Peoria campus and uh, you guys can uh, make you find your way back to where you were um, if you remain uh, standing, we're going to bring the man of God here in a second. But uh, they're going to be taking Brother Staten's group. And, uh, so y'all be nice to him. All y'all that was in Brother Staten's group that stay in there, would you please be nice to this couple? We don't want to throw them under the bus. We gave them that group because we feel like you're strong and established. And uh, they're just going to help pray for you and help secure you. And, and uh, just be care pastors. Amen. Praise God. We love our care pastors, don't we? I tell you what I do. I love these men and women. We couldn't do what we do without our care pastors. Amen. Praise God. Well, it is my honor and privilege to bring my friend. And I mean that with all my heart. You know, some friends you got to talk to all the time or they get their feelings bent. Brother Shelton's one of those that we can, we can talk frequently and be fine or we can go months. Send a text, hey, the, lo the phone fires up and we just pick up where we left off. Or he's one of those friends that I could call and say, hey, I need a word. You need friends like that. You need men of God in your life that you can call and say, hey, I need a word. We need one another. I said, we need one another. He wouldn't like this. God put all the gifts in the body for the edification of the body. And sometimes we like to prescribe the best gifts for ourselves. and say, well, I don't need this aspect. The scripture says God put apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in the church. 
the edification of the church. And if I've ever met a man that edifies the church, edifies the church. And uh, I know he fills the role of an apostle or a prophet at times, and I, I feel secure in saying the role of an apostle as well. He has spiritual authority wherever God sends him. And uh, I, I am grateful that he's my friend. <laughs> it's good to have the man of God as your friend, especially when he walks in these, in these realms. And uh, today he spoke to us at Beacon Church, j- just an incredible word of restoring. The church is the, has the ministry of restoration. The church has a ministry of, reconcili- or of restoration. We have the ministry of reconciliation, which is restoration did a beautiful job of edifying the church and telling us where we were, what to expect. That's edification. What to expect. They're going to come in. You're going to have to love them. You're going to have to restore them, regardless of what they look like. That message would go here in Peoria just as well. But he has a wonderful ministry of edifying the body. And you know, sometimes to build up, first you've got to fix what's there. You've got to tear it down just a smidgen. He don't have any problem doing that either. <laughs> That's what I love about you. He follows God, not the will of men. Amen. Would you put your hands together and welcome the man of God to the pulpit one more time. Brother Shelton, come take your liberty. I will say when he's finished, we have a baptism today. And we're looking forward to that baptism service. And we're going to have a wonderful time afterwards. But right now, hear the word of the Lord. Don't you love your pastor and his wife? Give honor to them, and I thank the Lord for them, our friendship. And um, that goes both ways, everything he said. Um, it goes both ways. Iron sharpeneth iron. And... Um, I'd I'd hate to have to think that I had to go through this world without a pastor and without some friends. And I'm I'm by nature a loner. I could sit and watch paint crawl. I mean, that's fine. I don't need people around me to be restored or have some sense of value or worth. But neither do I like having to reiterate friendships if we talk every day or every other day what difference does it make but if, if I've got some guys that say they're my friends and one of them was just wearing me out one day because I wouldn't answer the phone call when he was calling me and you know man I'm, I may have really needed you and so finally I, I feel like truth sometimes is Uh, the thing that most people don't want to hear sometimes. But you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I figured at that moment, I knew our friendship needed to be liberated. I said, well, I was in the bathroom. Would you prefer me answer the phone then? Uh, No. I said, okay, well, don't, don't take it that every time I don't answer, I don't like you. Because if I don't like you, I'll just call you up and tell you, you know what, we're not friends anymore. I don't like you, don't call me. (laughs) And thank God for good friends. And I consider your pastor to be one of those and uh, all of you that I have gotten to know here in this church to be those kinds of friends. Having said that, let's turn to the book of Galatians. Give honor to the bishop and Sister Lastly. Thank the Lord for them. Layers. They say in cold weather the best way to dress and prepare for it is layers. In spiritual conflict, the best way to prepare for it is with layers. And the enemy's got to go through layers to get to us. And aren't you glad there's people standing between you and the enemy? Even when you don't even know the enemy's after you. Somebody's there and before he can get to you he's got to go through them. 
thank God for layers. Galatians chapter number six. I told Brother John lastly, I said, I am yet as blank as a page. He said, well, as far as I'm concerned, you could redo what you did today. I thought, oh, well, kind of tweaked a little something there. Then the man of God started talking about it again. But Lashley looked over at me and said, all right, there it is, out of the mouth of two. So here we go. Brethren, uh, chapter number six, verse number one, the book of Galatians. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. If you're not, say, hold on. Y'all are cheating with that overhead deal, aren't you? Brethren, if a brother, brethren, if a man, He starts out with the word brethren, noting that we're all family. And then he says, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are what? Do what? Who? How? Doing what? For what reason? You can seat yourself in Jesus' name. Verse 2 says, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now I'm going to read it in the Amplified Classic because I like that version. Uh, Brings it on down into modern terminology. Brethren, if any person, he didn't say any kind of limitations on it. He says, if any person is overtaken in misconduct, Are sin of any sort, not just has a personality flaw, not just has something about them that we don't like. If any person is overtaken, that means they have fallen. In misconduct or sin of any sort, you who are spiritual who are responsive to and controlled by the Spirit. He explains what that term spiritual means. If you claim to be responsive to God and you claim that you are controlled by the Spirit of God, you should set him right. He didn't say set him straight. We got too much set him straight ministry in the church. Set him right means point him in the right direction. And restore and reinstate him without any sense of superiority and with all gentleness. Boy, there's a uh, jewel to have. Keeping an attentive eye on yourself. Isn't that cool? He said that while you're working on somebody else, you better be looking at yourself. Don't be working on them trying to figure out what all you really did while you were out there. Keep an attentive eye on yourself, lest you should be tempted also. Bear, endure, carry one another's burdens and troublesome moral faults. Troublesome means repetitive, not a one-time fault. Troublesome indicates that this is not just a one-and-done deal. They're struggling with something. And in this way, Fulfill and observe perfectly the law of Christ and complete what is lacking in your obedience to it. Ministering to other people is as beneficial to us as it is them. It it causes us to become introspective rather than uh, overtly looking around at everybody else all the time. David prayed different prayers and some of the most important impacting prayers he prayed was, Search me, O God know me, created me, making me, train me up, do whatever you got to do, but Lord, this inner man. We've spent a lifetime in the church. I've had this on long enough to let y'all know I believe in them, all right, but I got to go. My neck's fat and I don't like them. (laughs) We have spent a lifetime in the church dealing with people based on what they've done. And we have failed to deal with why they do it. And so it doesn't matter if you shut the door on them making this mistake, the problem still exists behind that door. 
And even though this door may be locked because of accountability, they're going to come around over here and in a little while find themselves in another situation where they're going to make another mistake. And I'm going to tell you something. It's probably as much of a shock to them as it is to you. I made the statement this morning. David begins to explain his credentials in going to battle with Goliath. And he says, a lion came and took a lamb from my dad's sheep. And a bear came and took a lion from my dad's flock. And he says to the king, in both cases, I pursued and overtook those predators. And he said, I smote the lion. And then while he was unconscious, I took that lamb out of his jaws. And I then had him delivered. And just as I was about to leave the area, I look up and the lion is coming to and now the lion turns on me. And at that point, then I turned my efforts to that lion again, and I killed him. And then the bear does the same thing. He comes along and steals a sheep. I chase him, knock him out, take the lamb from him. Then he turns his sights on me, and I had to kill him too. And the point of that whole story was that, yes, God will go to all the, the links of the world to try to help us and to save us, but we look at people that come into the church over and over and over and over. They come in, they go out. They come in, they go out. They come in, they go out. And we start to make some of the most asinine comments about their behavior. Like, boy, if they ever really pray through, they'll stick in this thing. They won't, they won't want the world anymore. Do you think for one second that those two lambs wanted to be snatched up by that lion and by that bear? Yeah, but they were out on the fringe of the herd. They may have been on the fringe of the herd. They may have been on the very outside layer of the sheepfold, but they were still part of the herd. We don't have the luxury nor the right to pass judgment on where somebody is in relation to the altar. They're not prayed through enough. They're not spiritual enough. They're in this building, and they're in this body. They're still part of the body, and they're my brother, and they're my sister, and it don't matter where they are in the kingdom. I've got a God-given mandate to protect them and watch over them. You are your brother's keeper. Well, I've heard it said, well, what they do, that's on them. You know what? That may be so. They may pay the price for what they've done, but they shouldn't have to go through it by themselves. <clears throat> intercession, I made the statement this morning, intercession is when your enemies become my enemies. We pray for people long enough, we pray for the lost. Oh my God, we gotta pray these backsliders back home. If we do that, we pray for them long enough that we overtake the lion and the bear that came and got them and we knock that thing unconscious long enough for them to get free of it and find their way back to an altar. They pray back through, they talk in tongues, we celebrate with them, we rejoice with them, and then we sit around wondering either out loud or in our own minds, I wonder how long they're gonna stick around this time. And don't act like you've never thought it. If you've had the Holy Ghost more than 30 minutes, you've thought it. Because we've seen those habitual sinners, those people that come in and go out and come in and go out, and we make crazy statements and we draw conclusions that we have no premise for. If they really love God, they wouldn't go back out there. But you know what? They have found hope in this world only. Therefore, they don't really understand that there is a way out of the mess they're in. Now, I personally have come to the conclusion, I think God led me to the conclusion, that one of the, the ministries that we have missed out on the most in the body of Christ is the ministry of restoration. He did not say anything in that passage of scripture that we've read that he would restore them. He did not take responsibility for their restoration at all. In fact, he makes it abundantly clear. If they're going to be restored, it's because you're going to love them and you're going to obey me and you're going to fulfill the law of Christ and do what I've told you to do, and that is to restore them. I don't care if they were the world's worst whoremonger while they were out on the street. They are yet your brother and they are yet your sister. Whatever God called them to do and be before they got tripped up and messed up, they're still called to do that because the scripture says that the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. You can't find one verse in that entire Bible that gives credibility to the fact somebody can mess their life up so bad they no longer have a ministry. And I submit to you, brethren, it's not in there. 
And if somebody sin absolutely makes them no longer a candidate for ministry, then what we preached about the blood wasn't true in the first place and all the baptizing we can do won't wash anything away. But if the blood works the first time, it'll work the 10th time or the 20th time. All you've got to do is reach out there and get a hold of the blood and plead the blood and pull it back over you and get back under the blood. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For by the law of the spirit of life in Christ, I am made free of the law of sin and death. So I don't care what the law of sin says you ought to pay for and how you ought to pay for it. The law of the spirit of life in Christ says you are not in bondage to the sin you committed. And I'd like for every perfect person that's never committed a sin to come gather up around this front and allow us all to pay homage to you. Because the book again says all have sinned. You have as well as I have talked to a lot of people that have gone out from us. And we use the term backslider but that's not really even a biblical term. Do you know what the scripture really calls the people we call backsliders? Disobedient children of God. I use this analogy. I have three children. And on any given day, at any given moment, one or more of them may be disobedient. But in their disobedience, I've never picked one of them up and thrown them out the front door of my house and said, you're out. You can't come back in here. I disavow you. You're not my child. I'm no longer your father. But as opposed to that, you know what I do to the disobedient child? I spend more time with them that day than I do the others if I'm doing my job right. If I'm doing my job right, the child that's got the, the child that's got the worst problems is the one I'm gonna pull closest to me and tell them, you know what? You don't have to be disobedient to get my attention. You don't have to be disobedient to get us to look at you. Mama and Daddy love you with all of our. I don't throw them away because they've made a mistake. I pull them closer to me because they've made a mistake. When they're afraid and when they've got problems and trust issues, the last thing in the world I need to be doing as a dad is compounding that and trying to tell them what a horrible time they are because they've got a problem but we've created careers in ministry blasting people because of issues they're dealing with they don't know what to do about and need help I said it this morning the purpose of Calvary one purpose of Calvary is to take sin cover it up but the devil has lied to us he said the job of the church is to reveal sin. If God revealed all the junk going on in this very room yet today, not past stuff, I'm talking about current struggles. Starting with mine. We'd all be like, whoa. If you had any idea what the blood has actually kept covered, why would God cover stuff? Because he's trying to save some. He'll do anything he's got to do to save you. If that means he's got to bring... To, now, condemnation and guilt and shame, that's not from God. But conviction is from God. And the fear of God comes from God. And when all of a sudden that spirit of conviction comes on us and, and, and there, somebody's preaching and talking about we need to repent and we need to get things right, you know what it is that keeps people sitting on the pew and not coming to the altar? It's not a devil. It's not a demonic spirit. It's those of us sitting around them that they don't know if we're going to look down our sanctified snoot while they walk to the altar. But I got news for you. I don't care if you like me or not. I don't care if you approve of me or not. But if I need Jesus, you're going to have to watch me walk to to an altar. I don't care what you think I did. I don't care what mistake you think I made. I just got to get under the blood. The only place I can be saved from is from under the blood. 
He who dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It goes on to say that a thousand will fall. You'll see the enemy afar off, and a thousand will fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, and none of it will come nigh to you. You won't know where the most safe and protected place in the world is? In the presence of God under the blood of the Lamb. I'm going to tell you something. We've made being saved a lot harder than Jesus did. Look, I got chest pain. I don't know. It may be spiritual. We've made, <laughs> we've made being saved harder than Jesus ever did. Ever. And we've made going to hell easier than Jesus did. I'm going to tell you something. Everybody sitting in here listening to me, you hear me when I tell you this. If you go to hell, you are going to have to work to get there, to get away from the love of God. Every step of the way, he's going to be right there with you saying, you don't have to go. You don't have to go. I still love you. It don't matter what you did. I still love you. I don't care where you've been. I'll still cover for you. It don't matter what you thought. It don't matter who you hated. It don't matter who you didn't want to forgive. If you'll just lay it down, you don't have to take that last step. Don't take that last step. I'm still right here. You'll have to go to hell with the voice of God in your ear telling you every step of the way. You don't have to be lost. But we do the opposite of that. We sit in the church threatening that, but you're going to bust hell wide open. And you know what, baby, some people are. But that's not for us to decide who is or who isn't going to be lost. It's up to us to decide to fulfill the law and the love of God and love one another and get one another out of this world on that great getting up morning when God calls us home. He said to the church now, my job is to forgive them. Your job is to restore them. <laughs> but we've inverted that one too. We've taken the stance that we'll decide who's going to get forgiveness. I had a man say to me about an individual that had fallen. Widely known, highly respected, fell into a trap. Guy calls me. He said, Brother Shelton, did you hear about so and so? I said, I'm not telling you if I heard about it or not. What do you want? He said, Has he got a ministry now? I said, You're the problem with us. People like you are our problem. But I said, Unfortunately, among us, no, he'll never have another ministry because we can't get past what he did. We don't want to admit that he was living that kind of a lifestyle while we were loving on him and bragging on him and preaching him and all of our stuff. We don't, we don't want to talk about that. Oh, well, we just want to sweep that under the rug and let that go on by. But the truth of the matter is the book says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. But the reason we got to throw people away is because we don't believe in spiritual authority and spiritual accountability. And we don't want to set men up among us that say, you know what, I verify that this man has been fully restored and is where he needs to be. Let's re-implement his ministry back into the body. He said, but I just don't know if I could ever sit and listen to somebody who's done what he's done. I said, well, what he's done is a lot less than what you're doing right now. You're sowing discord in the body because that brother, though he be fallen, is still part of the body. And you're trying to drive a wedge between me and him. Therefore, the book said, God hates you. God don't hate the adulterer. God don't hate the fornicator. God don't hate the liar. God don't hate the swindler and the heel grabber. But the book says these six things, yea, seven are an abomination unto God. And doth he hate? He that soweth discord among the brethren. And when you want to talk about what somebody else did, you're building a wall between me and them that's going to prevent God from loving them through me. And anything you do or say that causes separation between that fallen brother and another brother is discord. One translation says any person who seeks to divide the body forces upon themselves the hatred of God. So go ahead and gossip. Backbite. Run a little smear campaign.
A restored vehicle is worth more in its restored condition than it was the day it was purchased off the showroom floor. But restoration isn't just about adding a fresh coat of paint or two or three or however deep you want that paint to look. At some point in time, before all that starts, you're going to have to take that vehicle all apart. You're going to have to look under the carriage of it. You're going to have to look at the frame. You're going to have to look at all the motor mounts. You're going to have to look at all the springs. You're going to have to look at everything and find out what's rusted, what's messed up, what needs to be cleaned. Not inspect it so you can find out, my God, well, I know it. He's beyond hope. The scripture says, he remembereth our frame that it is but dust. We're the ones that forget that. We're the ones that lose sight of the fact that we are made from the most base. Had a man call me one time and his worship leader had fallen into some sin and he called me and he was just torn all to pieces. Oh, I can't believe he did that to us. Maybe I'm just messed up in the head. But I thought, are you, what, what in the wide world? He remembereth our frame that it is but dust. I said, did you elevate him to be God over the last six months or a year? Did you promote him in such a way that he was infallible? He is but a man. I'm not making excuses for it, but I'm not shocked when flesh does what flesh does. What I'm shocked about is when we won't restore them. Because we've allowed such a competitive spirit to come among us that one man's failure is another rung on the ladder for me going up. Now that he's in the pit, I may get to preach in that pulpit. I've walked into pastor's offices, Bishop, that I did not even know and had them look up at me and start spewing the most vile stuff you've ever heard. And I'm like, oh, pump the brakes on that. I don't want to hear all that about you. And I've had them say to me more than once, I need somebody to talk to that won't use what I say to destroy me but will help me overcome this and get the victory over it so I can be saved. I was driving through a metro area one day, Brother Lashley, and the Lord spoke to me. I was coming up, and there's a mall up there, and he said, look, there's a mall coming up. When you get there, pull in. Go into this department store and go up to the second floor. When you get off the escalator on the second floor, that's the men's department, you go to the left in the furthest corner of the men's department. You get in that corner, turn around, and back up into the corner where the two racks of suits come together. You just back right up in amongst them. Okie doke. I don't know how y'all do, but when the Lord tells me something, I just do it. I'm yet standing there. Sales associate after sales associates come by. Sir, can I help you? I highly doubt it. <laughs> Sir, what are you doing? I have no idea. <laughs> Why are you just standing here? Because the Lord, Brother Shelton, that really, yes. The Lord told me to come stand right here in this spot. And it probably lasted 30 minutes. And finally, out of the warehouse, the storage area back there, I hear a man's voice. And when I hear it, grief struck me. And I began to weep. And the Lord said, he's why you're here. I need to try one more time before he walks out to reach him. I'm standing there. I didn't know who it was going to be. I didn't recognize the voice. Come to find out it was a man that I knew at a distance. He walks out of that storeroom, turns and looks in that corner at me standing there, and tears like you would just, just turn the water faucet on tears started running down his face. He said, Brother Shelton, I know you're here because you've heard this and you've heard this and you've heard this and you've heard this and you've heard this. And, heard this. and I walked over and grabbed him by the shoulders. I said, Brother, I've not heard any of that. What I did hear is the Lord told me to come by here because he's trying one more time to get a hold of you before you walk through whatever door you're about to walk through and close your door behind you on the kingdom. I'm begging you, please don't do it. And you know what he said to me? We went to his office, and he wept and prayed and wept and prayed, and he looks at me and he said, I just don't think the brethren would ever allow me back. And today... He's as far gone from God as a man can be. There's nothing about him that even resembles that he ever knew what the inside of a church looked like. 
That's the point I'm making to you. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with. God will go to the end of the earth and try his best to hold on to you. But it's us that lets people go so easy. Now, when the Lord says he's done, he's done. Restoration is not something that we do based on where somebody's been. Restoration is something we do based on where somebody's going. And if they're trying to be saved, I have a biblical God-given mandate to help them become what they were. More valuable than they were in the beginning. Never let it be that we look at people that come in among us, our brothers and our sisters, and they pick up at all any sense that we have a disdainful, disapproving perspective on their life. Never let it be that any of us would ever go and ask a brother or a sister that had been away from the throne, what were you doing? My God. You know, and it's, it's like you, you make this mistake, we'll set you down for 10 days. You make this mistake, we'll set you down for six months. You do this, it's over. And that's not in that book. It's not in there. Okay, I'll tell them. I'll say it. They are going to come in off of the streets. Your brothers and your sisters. There are yet as many people sitting in this room today on the streets of this city that were once in the body just like you are. But today they're in the body, but they're not here because they're still our brothers and they're still our sisters. And there's a congregation as big as the one sitting here today that want to come home. They want. Have you ever heard the term homesick? Do you ever just get homesick? I've been homesick all afternoon, to be quite honest with you. I want to be where my wife and my babies are. I, I'm telling you, I cry almost every time I leave my house because I hate being away from them. I just want to go home. Ask me what I want on any given day. If I'm not at home, I want to go home. Ask me what I want when I'm home. I want to be home. I want to be where my family is. If I could have anything back in this whole world, it'd be my family members that have passed on. I don't want time back. I don't want my youth back. I want my family back. I want to hear my daddy again. I want to get a stupid phone call from my brother again. One of his dumb jokes. But I got some family that used to be in the body with me that my heart breaks just as much for. I want to hear him preaching again. I want to hear her singing again. I want to worship beside them in the pew. But they've got to know that I'm not going to be judgmental and critical and nosy and gossipy. And whatever amount of work it takes to bring them back to their original condition. I'm not talking about with an asterisk beside their name. I'm talking about bring them all the way back, restore them. That means to make them look as though there was never a blemish on them at all. That's my job. It's my job to restore a fallen brother or sister so perfectly that when somebody else who don't know their story looks at them, they can't guess their story. It's my job to defend you. It's my job that when people say, did you hear this about so-and-so, that I get immediately angry. That's not godly yet. Yeah, the book said be angry and sin not. I may not hit you, but I'm going to get mad at you. I'm not going to let you talk about my sister that's yet alive. I'm not going to let you run down my nieces and my nephews and my brother, my, 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 my own children or my cousins. I'm not going to stand by and let somebody attack my family. Just not going to do it. You open your mouth about my bunts, I may have to slap you. Now, I may not like them on some days, but that ain't none of your business. And we may not agree with everybody in this building. You may have a personality conflict with somebody in this building. But if the enemy's trying to drag them out that door, you better get yourself up and join the ranks with them and fight right along beside them for them. And if they're too beat up to fight for themselves, you need to get between them and their adversary and save them from being taken out of here. And when they come back, 
and you look up and they're in the altar and somebody says, oh my word. Can you believe they down at that altar looking like a hot mess? You need, you need to look up, tell, you need to shut your little cake hole and don't say one more word. That's my brother. That's my, you talking about my family. You don't have a right to talk about them. You don't have a right to talk about where they are and their walk with God. You don't have a right to say if they love God, they'd be doing this and they wouldn't be. You're not God. Restoration means you got to overlook some stuff. But don't let the enemy trick you and tell you that's compromise. That's not compromise. I didn't say you got to deny the truth. But if you're going to restore some people, you've got to overlook some of their current conditions in order to love them and say, you know what, baby, I know, I know you're going through hell, and I know every minute of every day seems like a nightmare, but joy is coming in the morning. I'm going to be right here with you, and if they're going to make fun, you know what, if we got to, you know what we ought to do to people that fall and make a mistake and everybody finds out about it? We ought to publicly restore them and dare anybody in the building to say something about them. We don't need to tar and feather you and run you out. We need to surround you and say, oh, no, baby, you mine. You belong here, and nobody's going to pull you out of here. Nobody's going to talk about you. Nobody's going to run you off. That's restoration. you got to be brave to be in the ministry of restoration. you got to have a spine to be in the ministry of restoration. Because some self-righteous person will be looking, oh, yeah, well, you're condoning what? Condoning nothing. You don't know the conversations we had behind closed doors. You don't know the rebuke the man of God may have given them. But that's not my problem. That's not my, res my responsibility. Oh, oh, oh. There are two dimensions in the church. There's the father dimension that he represents. That's the corrective dimension. And then there's the mother. Oh, there's the mother dimension, which is you, the body of Christ. You are the bride of Christ, i.e. the mother dimension. So when daddy has corrected the baby and put the baby back out in the living room with everybody else, the mother comes up and says, you know what? Daddy was right, and it's okay. We're going to get past this together. We're going to love you. We're going to get over this. We don't need but one person doing the job of the Father in the house of God. And it's him. Are any of these other men in pastoral ministry that he delegates that authority to? We are so quick to jump up on the rebuking stump and just lay the thunder to somebody. Go ahead. Consider yourself though. Because mm -hmm, them chickens are going to come home. To, I don't care where they've been all day long. They're going to come home to roost. And you reap what you sow. You don't want to have mercy with somebody else, you ain't going to get no mercy. And, and for those... Okay. For those of you that won't let people restore you because you can't forgive yourself. We can't start restoring you until you forgive yourself. And there's somebody in this section of seats right here that's hearing all this stuff I'm saying and you're struggling with the fact you can't forgive yourself. There's two people over here. And about halfway back, between the halfway point and the back row back there, there's two that you got some stuff in your head. You're thinking, yeah, but. <laughs> Don't be lost over yeah, but. Don't spend one more day suffering because you think we might have a different opinion about you than you've got about your own self. I personally think I can vouch for the majority of the people in this room. We don't care where you've been. Can I get a witness? We don't care what you've done. Can I get a witness? We don't care who you were with. Can I get a witness? What we care about is where you're at right this minute. Can I get a witness? What I care about is where you're going from this point forward. Can I get a witness? Jesus asked a definitive question. 
How can you love him whom you've seen? How can you love, how do you profess to love him whom you've not seen when you can't love him whom you've seen? It's my job to love you. I can't really have any chance at loving God if I can't love you. I can't know the love of God if I don't let. Do you know what the greatest dimension of spiritual maturity is? When God can love anybody he wants to through me without me arguing with him over it. When God can love my worst enemy through me and me not fuss about it. When God can love the person in the church I think deserves it the least through me and me not give him every reason why I shouldn't sow a hundred dollar seed into their life. Restoration is our job. Forgiveness is his. But he can't even fully forgive you until you forgive yourself. It costs nothing to be kind to and love somebody. But it could cost them everything if you don't. Somebody come in, they going through hell, and you know they're going through hell, and they come in, and they're not acting just right, and they're not doing just right, and you want to sit back and talk about Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was on the second row for the last six months. Guess he's on his way out the back door because he's back to the fourth row. If you're worried about what row you own, i.e., should be the first row, you would know what row, what row he was on. But we will position ourselves on sanctified purchase throughout the body so we can keep an eye. <laughs> Don't be doing that very same thing on that great getting up morning yeah. by yourself because all them people you look down your nose at going to be gone in the rapture. Oh, yeah. I asked the question last night, who's saved in here? Nobody. Do you know what's going to save us all on that day? We are saved by what? And what is grace? Something you didn't earn. Something you didn't deserve. And somebody may be right up in the middle of some road rage on their way to work. I'm not talking about you, Brother Clausen. I'm just looking at you. (laughs) Somebody may be having a bad minute. And Jesus comes. And in that moment, the grace of God is going to cover a multitude of junk. If you have no sin, feel free to throw a rock. But they're coming home. And they want to just come home. They don't want to appear before a tribunal. They don't want to appear before the Supreme Court waiting on us to hand down our decision. And I'm going to tell you yet another thing. There are musicians and singers and preachers and teachers and evangelists and all sorts of ministries that have been taken from us that are going to find their way back into the kingdom at one of these campuses where you need a musician. He was in the beer joint last week. My brother was down there and saw him. Yeah, but he's in the kingdom today. What, do you want to learn to play the piano all over again? For goodness sake. And I'm going to tell you something else. There are going to be some people left out of here without a drop of ink on their flesh at all, and they're going to come back in here with numbers tattooed on the back of their eyelids and on the front of their eyelids, and every time they blink, you're going to have to look at it. Be standing up here holding a microphone with stuff tattooed on their knuckles. I don't believe I can handle that. Well, you're probably going to have a hard time going to heaven too because they're going to be all over that place. I'm just telling you. And the problem with most Pentecostal churches is they look all Pentecostal. 
a, a Pentecostal church where everybody looks like we say we're supposed to look is not a revival church. It's not an apostolic church. And if you're going to wait till somebody gets all that stuff fixed to let Jesus find their place in the kingdom, you need to take a trip back through time and find out who it was hanging on that cross, whose blood it was that ran down that cross, and then if it wasn't yours, shut your mouth and march and get on with it. The ministry of restoration belongs to the body. They're your brother, they're your sister, they are our body. We are one body. And if they're sick, I'm sick. If they hurt, I hurt. If they've got a problem, I've got a problem. If they're in a mess, I'm in a mess. You've heard it said, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And then let me remind you what scripture says, whatever you do to the least of the kingdom, you've done it to him, he said. I love you, but they're coming. They're going to walk in drunk and leave sober. They're going to crawl in here so stoned out of their head, they don't even know what day of the week it is. And they don't need a lecture from some sanctified saint of God talking about you ought to leave them drugs alone. And they're going to look at you and think, my God, that's why I'm here. I'm trying to get away from them. Can you quit griping at me long enough to kill what keeps taking me? David didn't run out there and jump on the sheep because they was in a lion's mouth. He didn't run out there and scold the lamb because a bear got it. And do you think those two lambs wanted to live on the edge of the herd anymore? No. Nah. Well, they just won't get close to us. I wonder if they're afraid of us. Let this be from this day forward part of your mantra as the apostolic church in this region. We love you just like you are. All this other stuff is God's business to take care of and clean up and straighten up and deal with. My job is to help you understand what you read. My job is to help explain the word of God to you. And it is not my, it is not my job to give you some revelation. The Spirit of the Lord will lead and guide into all truth and righteousness. They're coming. Somebody going to be standing up here preaching the Word of God, head just slick as a cue ball and going to have an eight tattooed right on top of his head. Can you deal with it? I told the story this morning. There's a church I've been in preaching, and the short version of it is a backslidden apostolic preacher walked in the doors dying from AIDS, living a lifestyle that had taken him places he never knew he was going to go. They swarmed him. Nobody knew him. Nobody knew anything about him. Just here in the last year and a half, they swarmed him at an altar. Prayed him through. The next day, he's on life support in the hospital. The saints of God were right there praying with him, praying with him, praying with him. Nobody knew anything about this man. At the end of the day, God restored his body. God brought him out of that sickness. God did a miraculous work in his life. He is now in that church functioning. He is one of the greatest soul winners in that church. He brings more people to that church than people that have been in that church their entire life and never walked out the doors and never did one thing wrong out there in the world. And do you know that church now, I think probably a lot of people know some of his story because he's told some of it. But nobody looks at him and thinks, oh my God, really, you, you were out there, you lived that life, you did this, you did that. No, no. You know where they are? They're working the altars with their arms around him and everybody's praying with him and he's praying with everybody and God's doing all kind of stuff. And little by little by little, God's restoring his ministry. And the only thing that I can tell that his ministry is waiting on is him to fully believe that God really wants to restore him and completely put him back in the place of ministry he was at. Are we saved, rapture ready, full of salvation? 30 seconds after you baptize somebody today? Is that person going to be ready to go? If they've been filled with the Holy Ghost, water baptized in Jesus' name, are they ready to go? 
30 seconds separated from their old life. They're ready to go. Then where do we get off trying to put mandated times? Yeah, but they need to be saved long enough before, you know, my God, we're going to. Okay, I asked this question today at the house. How long was that eunuch saved that Philip expounded the gospel to before he became an evangelist and reached his entire community? That afternoon. How long did it take that whoremongering woman at the well to turn into something besides a $2 hoe and become an evangelist? As long as it took her to get up from that water well and walk back into the city and confess, hey, the guy, you know what, y'all know me, you know what I've been doing, but there's a man out here at this well. <laughs> I ain't never met nobody like this. He knew, this dude knew everything I've done. He knew the guy I'm with now ain't even my own husband. But see, some of y'all tightened up on me because you, you want to, oh, right here in this section, you keep it up, I'm going to come call you out. It is not our job to decide who God's going to use and who God's not going to use. He took a woman that was living the life of promiscuity, met her at a water well, told her, I'm the one you've been looking for, introduced himself to her, and she turned into an evangelist within an hour and had turned an entire city out to hear about Jesus. That woman who had not even fully come to a revelation of everything she needed to know won more people to God in that day than the disciples had done in the last six months. How long did it take a demoniac to become an evangelist? A few hours? Yeah, but you haven't been in church long enough to go through our discipleship program. And that discipleship nonsense is a cop-out. Everybody likes discipleship because usually it's a department in the church with about eight people in it, and the rest of us don't have to do anything. I shout myself down. You ain't got to help me. He's full of the devil this morning. This evening, Jesus is leaving. He wants Jesus to take pity on him. Jesus says, I'm not going to take pity on you because I have endued you with power. And if I don't leave you in your mess, you're never going to really know what I put in you. We look at people and say, oh, you know, they ain't been in church very long. I, I, don't, I really don't see that. I don't, I don't understand what they're doing on the platform. Well, if you spend the right amount of time in the altar, you'd understand why they're on the platform. Are you with me? They're coming home. We need to let them. Would you play something melodiously, give them some sense of false hope? Nah, I'm really, I'm done. I sat in a church service one night. Well, it wasn't a church. It was a beating. It was a brawl. I didn't know what was going on when I first got there. I was driving through this town, and I knew the local pastor, and I thought, you know what? I was going to get a hotel pretty close there anyway, and I thought, I'm just going to just go on in here and sit down and just be a part of this service. Well, Bishop, when I walked in, I sat on the back row. And the pastor was in the pulpit, and he was laying the, th I'm talking about red face, laying the thunder to the people of God. Well, when he got through, somebody else stood up, come to a mic in the center aisle, and they laid the thunder to him. Well, the, the, come to find out, the meeting was designed so they could all put their apparently knowledgeable minds together and figure out why they couldn't grow as a church. And I'm thinking, really, it's, it's not obvious to y'all what the problem is. Pastor looks up and sees me sitting there. He said, Brother Shelton, I'd like for you. Uh, <laughs> I said, Brother, I, had I known y'all were having this meeting, I wouldn't even have come in the building. I, I really, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say anything. He kept talking. I thought, just as soon as everybody quits goosenecking at me, I'm going to get up and leave. And so help me. I had no more thought that, and the brother looked at me a second time. 
Brother Shelton, I really would like for you to kind of weigh in on this as a third party. I believe you're here on purpose. God sent you here, no doubt about it. In my mind, I want you. Oh, the devil is a lie. I'm not saying nothing. I said, Brother, I don't, I really don't want to say anything, and I don't really have anything to say. I, I, I would really rather not get involved. He went on, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me. He said, now he's going to come back a third time, and this time you're going to accept his invitation, and you're going to say exactly. Oh, I can scratch this place off of my list of preaching points. <laughs> sure enough, here he come that third time around. Brother Shelton, I really would like for you to... I stood up, I said, before I say anything, I want it to be on the record that I have tried yet two times to get out of this. But you've insisted. Now I'm going to tell you what the Holy Ghost will not give me an option to say. How many of you saints love your pastor enough that you've spent any time in prayer for him or his wife in the last year? Oh, my God, nobody. Oh, boy, he started filling his oats, and he just he was fixing to let them have it again. I said, ta, 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 ta. How many of these people have you prayed for and fasted and sought God for and stood between them and eternity? He put his head down. I said, how many of you saints have ministered to one another? There's many widows in this room. How many of you well-abled men have gone and fixed their plumbing? How many of you well-abled men have gone and cut their yard? How many of you have gone and helped them do laundry or helped them do anything? How many of you have loved one another and blessed one another at all? Nobody. In, in a year at least. I said, then why in the world would the great God of heaven Send the lost into a place filled with people who hate each other. Just to become a culture of this hatred. A part of this culture of hatred. By this might all men know that you're my disciples. That you have love one for another. Love is something you do. And to truly love somebody will not allow you to sit idly by while they suffer in silence. To truly love somebody with the love of God will not allow us to sit by while they struggle fitting in the body again. The true love of God will not allow you to sit comfortably in the seat section that you have become accustomed to sitting in. When one of our brothers or sisters are sitting toward the back, struggling to even stay in the service because the enemy's lying to them and their flesh is reminding them of every fault, every flaw, and every failure. Don't go get them and tell them, come sit up here with me. Get your stuff and go ask them, can I sit with you? Will you go out and eat with us after church? I don't care if they stink. I don't care if they vomited on themselves because of being overhung and walked in here straight off the street how much do I love him where do you think we show our love for God to one another they're coming home there are people sitting in this room today that need some restoration they've got the front fender fixed and that right rear quarter panel's been replaced but that bondo hadn't been sanded down yet and there's some things on the upholstery some interior stuff that needs to be done and I know it's going to take some courage to say it's me but those that I have picked up on in this service and some of you have sat here and wept most of the day if you want someone to work on you and help restore you and you want that next phase of restoration to start today would you get up out of your seat with courage and come to this front right now about 12 more seconds all I'm going to wait not going to beg you 
I can't make you want it. If you don't want it, there's one. If you've been having trouble forgiving yourself and you can't get past what you've done, your mistakes, long enough to let the body love you, today's that day. You've got about 10 seconds if that's you. If you've ever walked out on God and you still feel like you are not fully back to where you want to be, you got about five seconds to get up and get moving. Now, the rest of you, that are either exactly where you need to be or didn't feel compelled to make a move and you're willing to be a part of the ministry of restoration come and join yourself to some of these broken hurting people and stay with them today apply a little light grit start washing them off cleaning them up blessing them. Come on, it don't matter why they're down here. That's none of our business. Come on. Come on. There you go. This is ministry. This is ministry. The believers are doing this. The body of Christ is doing this. You're loving your brother. You're loving your sister. And if you're down here for ministry, it don't matter what brought you here. It matters where you go from here.
you. And you reciprocate the love of God. And you just let God love you. you I love you I don't know who you are I don't know what you may struggle with to the best of my knowledge brother Nolan I, I, I don't have anything against anybody and I want to be a vessel to be used of God to love others but I know I'm imperfect I'm human. And sometimes when we're hurt, we're hypersensitive. I'm talking to those that came down today. Because I'm struggling with something on the inside. Katrina, I'm not perfect, sweetheart, but you have to believe in me and allow me to love you. God loves us because he's our heavenly father. And his word, he can't lie, he's got to be true to his word. But you can look at me and you say, that's pastor, he's, he's not God. But the love of God was shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. You gotta let me love you. I'm imperfect. But I love you. And you gotta accept that. For us to get along, you have to believe that I love you. You're imperfect. So am I believe that God loves you? He has to. He's God, right? But do you believe that I love you? Then why'd you look down when I ask you? You see, I'm not picking on him. There's something on the inside of us. The hurt. The pain. When God tells us he loves us, we can believe that because he's infinite and he's God. But when my brother tells me he loves me, I measure myself among my, and I know that I've failed. And we measure ourselves whether we're good enough for the love of a brother or a brother's good enough, oh God, to love us. By this shall man, all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another, and it's reciprocated. You let me love you, and you love me back. You know how faith operates? by love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about all these supernatural gifts, all these abilities, but they don't find their foundation in love. They're worthless. The culture of the church needs to be love. Out of love flows worship. But everything that we do needs to be because I love you you love me and together we love God love covers a multitude of sins 
oh, I know you're not perfect, but you know I'm not perfect. I love you anyway. I hope you love me. Man, I about didn't recognize you. This dude we saw at Chili's last night, he had a full beard. I love you, Shannon. I've loved you since you came in as a young person in a youth class. I loved you when you went your own way. I was so ecstatic the day I saw you walk back through the doors. Once I recognized who you were, I was like, yes, he's home. Come on. Amen. Praise God. We have baptism today. This is hilarious. Brother Shelton said, well, I'm not going to be long today. That's the same thing I have said for every Saturday night prayer meeting. I told you there was a flow here, and it just happens. Amen. Uh, Sister Sierra is here to be baptized, and uh, we're so excited about this. And our families come to, to uh, encourage her and support her in this endeavor. Y'all are more than welcome to come up if you would like. Uh, we could part the Red Sea over here. Praise God. We're so glad that they've come. And uh, I would say I'm sorry that service went as long as it did. But it's been an incredible service. And we're grateful that you're here with us. Um, I wish today were normal. I wish this was a normal service. I would like more normal services like this. Um, but be that as it may, uh, it may or may not be normal. And uh, I got you. Family, come on. Children, can you find your parents, please? Come find your Jack. Come find your parents. Thank you. wonderful step of faith, and uh, we're so excited about uh, this step of faith, this family, and uh, we're just excited about what God's doing here. Amen. bless you. We're so glad that you're here this evening. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Uh, greet one another. Love one another. We'll see you Wednesday night.